worship. So we just thank the Lord. Just want to uh, take this opportunity just to uh, you know, give God thanks. And, uh, you know, coming to church should never be a burden. It should be a, an honor and a privilege. So we're thankful that the Lord has brought us here tonight. I, I would like to just, somebody can help me pass some of these out tonight. I just have some handouts for you. And uh, just take one and pass them around. We're just going to get right into our study. I'm not going to do too much on the PowerPoint tonight. We're just going to uh, we're going to do more of a, of a Bible study this evening, and we're going to be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and um, we're going to be following more or less this outline that's here, and this is out of our growing up spiritually study, and this is on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the power of God, you may have thought to yourself, well, I already have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, why do I need to hear it again? Well, the Bible says, like Peter said, it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you. And uh, if anything, it's, it, it, it's a blessing. And uh, so you can never know all that there is to know about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and all the benefits that come along with it. Uh, if you speak in tongues, praise God, um, we can speak in tongues more than what we're already doing. If you don't, and you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, well, good news, God has a special gift for you, and it's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So, um, you and me see it, by the way. Um, so, it, it's, it's a blessing that I believe that it's a gift from God that I believe is for every believer. It is not just for a few select, it's for everyone. And anyone who wants to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, uh, God has made himself available, and God has said in his word that if, you know, if we, if we ask him for the Holy Spirit, he will give it to us. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So, um, you know, so we want to kind of go through this, and, and this, if you lead a Bible study anywhere, you can use these notes. These are very powerful, very powerful meaning, and if you have, you know, anybody that you you meet with regularly, uh, these notes will really lay out the whole doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, very, very nicely. So I would encourage you, you know, we're not going to read through every single line here. We're going to read through some of it, and I'm going to teach you, and we're going to just get into it. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, tonight. We thank you for your word. Lord, we just ask you tonight, Heavenly Father, that you would just anoint your word, anoint this teaching, open our hearts, open our ears. Help us, Lord, to see what we could not see before. Help us to, 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 to just to, to take this message in and internalize it, Lord. Lord, make it real to us tonight, Father. And we give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the power of God, uh, the outline of everything that's contained herein is on the first page of introduction, born of the Spirit versus baptized with the Spirit. Uh, receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the doorway to the supernatural. So why don't we just turn turn through this and we can just get started. We'll, we're looking at the introduction. Everybody should have a copy. We have more than enough going around. Let's just read this first paragraph before we really get started. This will kind of open it up for us a little bit. Uh, After Jesus was raised from the dead, he appeared to his disciples numerous times. For the space of 40 days, he was with them, teaching them about the kingdom of God. Yet, they still needed something from God before they would be ready to go out with the good news of Jesus' resurrection. Jesus said that they needed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples to wait for the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This baptism in the Holy Spirit was predicted by John before the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He who is coming after me, Jesus said, is mighty, or John said, is mightier than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And there's references there. And just want to draw your attention to that highlighted section there, the bold part, where it says they still needed something from God before they would be ready to go out. When Jesus started his earthly ministry, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit came upon him in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible talks about the fact that, and actually verses 21 through 22, that when he came to the river Jordan, that John the Baptist was baptizing there, and that 
when Jesus was being baptized, the Holy Spirit came, came down upon him like a dove, descended upon him, and from that moment on, the Bible says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And it was from that period, from that moment on, that we see the miracle working power of Jesus being performed. And we see that throughout his entire ministry. We have no record of Jesus performing any miracles prior to that River Jordan experience. And that was a type of baptism in the Holy Spirit that Jesus experienced. And then when his disciples were underneath his ministry, were under him, he empowered his disciples to basically do what he was doing. He sent them out two by two. They went out to cast out demons. They went out to heal the sick. But that was under his ministry. That was directly under him. But he told his disciples that there's going to come a time where I'm going to ascend to the right hand of the Father, and I am going to send the power. I'm going to send the promised Holy Spirit, the one who has been with me, who has been operating through me, is going to come upon you. And he's going to be inside you. And he's going to lead you. And he's going to guide you into all truth. And he told them, before you go out, and before you do the works that I'm doing, before you share and go and witness and operate in the supernatural, before any, any of that, I want you to go to Jerusalem. And I want you to wait for the promise of my Father. And if we go to Luke chapter 24, what we find there in verse 49, Luke 24 you have your Bibles, you can, you can turn there. If not, you can just follow along. Luke 24, verse 49. The author, Luke, our, his, our first church historian, writes, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye, or wait in the city of Jerusalem, until you are endued with power from on high. Now, why would he tell them to wait, to be endued with power from on high? Weren't, weren't they already with Jesus? Weren't they already performing miracles with him? And why, why would they wait? Because Jesus knew that when he leaves, he's got to have a replacement. And that was going to be the Holy Spirit. Was going to replace him. And he even said in one place, he said in John, unless I go, the comforter will not come. Unless I, unless I go away, he's not going to come. And so it's necessary for me to leave so that I can send him, so that the Father can send him. So you go and you wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Power to do what? Power to do what Jesus was doing. That's what he was telling his disciples. And you have to connect the Gospel of Luke with the book of Acts, because Luke, our first church historian, he wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. So it's a two-volume set. So when you get to the end of Luke, you gotta go, you gotta read his sequel to part two of his movie, which is the book of Acts. So turn over to Acts chapter one, and we'll see what he where he picks up. We've just read at the end of his gospel. Now he picks up with the same theme. It's kind of like when you go to the movies and you 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 see at the end of the movie, and then you a year later, part two comes out, and part two begins with the opening scene from the previous movie. Or, or at the end of that movie, it starts in that new movie. Well, Acts is kind of like that in chapter one. It's similar, because right here, Luke is gonna pick up with the same theme, and this is what he says in verse four, chapter one, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard, me, heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from, him, from now. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Verse 8. But, it's, it's like Luke keeps just bringing us back to this. But you shall receive power. The Greek there is dunamis, is where we get the uh, word for dynamite. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon these disciples, they will receive dunamis. They will receive dynamite power. They're going to do what? To do what Jesus was doing. And you will be my witnesses. So 
technically they're not witnesses, true evangelists, until the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And my friends, the same is true for you and I. We need the same Holy Spirit, the same power that the disciples had if we're going to do the works that Jesus did. Jesus said, Jesus said, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And he's saying, greater works than these shall he do because I go unto the Father. And what's he going to do when he goes to the Father? He's going to send the Holy Spirit. And where do we see this unfolding? Well, go to chapter 2 in Acts. Now, here's where the Holy Spirit comes. And when the, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Holy Spirit comes in and fills them with the Holy Spirit. And what is the evidence there that we see? They begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Utterance. And from that moment on, all the way through the book of Acts, we see them performing healings, miracles, signs, and wonders. And we are still writing the book of Acts. The book of Acts doesn't end in Acts chapter 28. We're still writing. We're living it out. And so we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And there are various benefits to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It'll empower you for daily living. It'll empower your prayer life. It'll enable you to, to operate in the supernatural as God wills and as he moves. It'll help you with intercessory prayer. It'll help, you to, it'll help you when you're praying for things that you don't know what to pray for. And there will be an extra added power in your life that you have never experienced before if you've not known the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I believe it is for every child of God. And it is something different than being born again. Being born again and being baptized with the Holy Spirit are totally two separate events. And we're going to go through some scripture and we're going to look at that. Look at paragraph, look at uh, point number two, Roman numeral number two, born of the Spirit versus baptized with the Spirit. Let's just read that first paragraph. At the new birth, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside a believer. The scripture clearly states that anyone who is born again has the Spirit of God within them. Romans 8, 9. He is there to teach, admonish, and to bear witness. However, when a person is born again, he or she is not automatically baptized with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Being born of the Spirit and baptized with the Spirit are two distinct manifestations of the Spirit of God. No one can be baptized with the Spirit until he or she has been born of the Spirit. And we see a beautiful depiction of this, my friends. When we look at the Samaritan revival, and you can turn there in your Bibles, in, in Acts chapter 8, if you just want to turn over there real quick, uh, this is where Philip was ministering, and he's ministering in Samaria, and he's preaching, and the Bible says in verse, in verse 16, in Acts chapter 8, verse, actually we can go up to verse 14, it says, and when the, the, now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, actually back up to verse 12, uh, but when they believed, this is Philip, he's ministering to them. So it says, when they believed, Philip preached, Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Just stop right there. It says, when they believed, when the Samaritans believed, when they got, they got born again, they believed, they got born again, and then they got baptized, which is what we do after we become born again. We get baptized, water baptism, water baptism, and being baptized in the Holy Spirit, two separate events, two separate experiences. But they got water baptized. But now, let's go on. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. They've been born again, but now... They have to have the second experience, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were about to receive the Holy You could use that term when he talks about, see, when you got born again, you got the Holy Spirit. You know, you, the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. It's impossible for you to be born again and not have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. But when you get born again and 
you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's a, it's like a greater release that happens in your life. It's like he does something more in your life. It's, like, it's, it's, it's an immersion into the full experience of the Holy Spirit. And so that's probably the best way that I can describe it for now, but we'll, we'll get into that as we go. Verse 16, it says, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I mean, they had only believed, they had only been water baptized, that was it. But verse 17, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon, the sorcerer, saw that through laying out of hands, the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. So the point I just want to draw out of this is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is there are two separate experiences. Being born again is your first experience, and then the second work of the Holy Spirit is to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, to, to be filled, to be immersed. The word baptism actually means immersion. Actually, the King James Version uses the word baptism. This is just a side note for all of you theologians out there. They used the translators, when they were translating, they knew that the word baptism meant immersion. But they knew that they were dealing with different types of theologies in that day. Because in that day, some people were getting sprinkled. They were just, some were getting fully immersed. Some were just getting their heads done. So to kind of stay on clear ground, they just used the word baptism. That was it. So, but the, but the Greek word literally means to immerse fully. To Im immerse. So to be immersed fully in the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like getting dunked in the Holy Spirit, if you will. So uh, that's just a little side note, nothing, nothing there really to draw. Um, let's go to page two here. Look at Saul's conversion. Let's go over to Acts chapter nine. <clears throat> Acts chapter nine, we all know the story about Saul, who's whose name was later changed to Paul, who was murdering Christians, hauling them off, imprisoning them. And he has an encounter with the Lord in Acts chapter nine, verse five. Uh, the Lord knocks him off his horse and he says, who are you, Lord? So we look at that as his conversion experience. Well, later Ananias has a, has a vision. The Lord appears to him and says, go, to, go, down, and just, and, and go to, down to this house and you're going to see a man there. His name is Saul. And I want you to go there and lay hands on him because he's been blinded. And, you know, and basically, you know, give him, give him some instructions. And Ananias goes down there. And verse 17 says, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on, on him, said, Now watch this key word. You might have underlined in your Bible, because you could tell Paul was born again. Otherwise, Ananias would not have called him brother. Ananias called it, says, Brother Saul. So we know, and Paul at this point is obviously born again. So he says, Brother Saul. You don't call somebody a brother or a sister in the Lord unless they're a believer, right? So he says, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto you in the way as you came, has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he's born again because Ananias is brother Saul, but he says now also you're going to get your healing for your sight and that you might be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forth with inner rose and was baptized. So in this case, he believed, he got his healing. Well, he got saved first. He got his healing. He got filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he got water baptized. In the Samaritan revival, they got born again, baptized in water, and then they got filled with the Holy Spirit. So what that tells you, it doesn't matter which order you put that in. It doesn't matter whether you get born again. Well, you have to get born again first. That's where it all starts. But it doesn't matter if you get baptized in water first or if you get filled with the Holy Spirit first and then get water baptized. It, it, it doesn't matter because in two different accounts, it, it, it was reversed. The only thing that we can say is that you need to be born again first before you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So that that's a given. And then if we go down to uh, point C, Cornelius' conversion, just that first line, I'll read it. There are instances where people are saved and filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time. I'm not going to turn there to read that story, but you can go there and read it later on. Um, but that's Acts chapter 10, verse 44. Um, there, there are times where someone will get born again, and then right in that experience, they'll get filled with the Holy Spirit. For me, it was a little different. For me, I had gotten born again, and then I, it was a few months later, I 
got water baptized, and right after I got water baptized, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And that was, that was my experience. Uh, some of my friends, they had gotten baptized in the Spirit relatively quickly, more, more quickly than I had when we all had gotten saved. So, but there's no time, that you should never feel pressured if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you should never feel pressured, I, I, you know, that, oh, it hasn't happened, so it must not be for me. No, you know, God, you know, you, you have to just keep seeking Him. You know, don't, don't quit on God. Don't, don't give up on Him. I, I believe, you know, He rewards those who diligently seek Him. So sometimes we don't receive because we're thinking, thinking about it wrong, and there are some hindrances to it. And if we have time, we'll get into some of that tonight. So just looking at this, if we look at the New Testament, for example, just looking at some of the, uh, just continuing along this, this theme of, of being born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's, in the New Testament, there's, the, the, the water is a, is a type of Holy Spirit. So I just want us to take a look real quick. Look, look at uh, the first paragraph there under point D. Regeneration by the Spirit and in the baptism of the Spirit are two distinct works of the Spirit of God. They each result in a manifestation of the presence of God within the believer, but those manifestations are not the same. The difference is well illustrated in two statements made by Jesus and recorded in the Gospel of John. Um, one, a well of water. Look at John 4, 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Look at that paragraph, that last paragraph. Water is often used in the Bible as a symbol of God's Spirit. The Spirit in a born-again believer is a well of water, bringing eternal life to those who possess it. The well is always there to quench a man's spiritual thirst for God and to sustain him or her. Every born-again believer has this well of the waters of God's Spirit within him. And I, I just love this verse in, in verse 14 where it says that, that, that when the, whoever drinks this water will never thirst, he says, and this water that I give him, he says, will be a water, spring, a, a well, springing up to eternal life. Now, a well is pretty much, it's, it's, not, it, it's not a river. It's, not a, it's, it's more like a, it's, it's, it's a, not necessarily, well, it's stagnant, if you will. It's just, it's just there. You know, the, the, if you have a well, okay, there's water in it, and you draw out of that well. But a river is something different. Now, what he's referencing, what this is a type of being born again in John 4, 14. A well of water springing up to eternal life. Now, that's being born again. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, on the other hand, is like a river that, he, that flows out of your belly. Look at page 3 there, rivers of living water, point 2. Jesus said in John 7, 38, He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living waters. So being born again is like receiving that well of spirit of living water. And thank God for that. But God has something more for you. He's got a river of living water that he wants to, to come out of you, to flow out of your innermost being. And I believe that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or at least a type of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, just looking at it from a New Testament perspective, you have the well of water, and then you have a river of living water. Now, in the Old Testament, you've got types and shadows. There are types and shadows. If you look at point number E, Old Testament type of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, we see a type, a symbol of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When Israel crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land, Israel's passing through the Red Sea symbolized water baptism and our separation from the world. That's Exodus 14.22. We, we're all familiar with that where Israel passed through the Red Sea. That's a type of coming out of Egypt, coming out of slavery, coming out of darkness, going from darkness to light. This is their quote-unquote or a type of born-again experience of you leaving the old behind and entering into a new life, new life with Christ. But then it says that uh, but before the nation could pass into the Promised Land, they had to cross another impassable physical barrier. So God brought them out of Egypt but before they could get into the promised land, they had a one more river to pass, and that was the River Jordan. God parted the waters of this river as he did the waters of the sea, Joshua 3, 14 through 17. The crossing of the Jordan by the miraculous power of God symbolizes the baptism in the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. 
So you have the crossing of the Red Sea, which is a type of born-again experience, where they come out of Egypt, the world of darkness, and they enter into their promised land, or almost into their promised land, but that's like a type of born-again experience. Now, there's a second experience. They've got to pass through the River Jordan, and when they pass through that River Jordan, they finally enter that river, that promised land, and that is a type of baptism in the Holy Spirit. So, meaning God has more for you if you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he has more for you than what you have. If you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have not yet crossed the River Jordan. You are still, you just only crossed the Red Sea. And you're on that side, and that's good, and thank God for that, and you're going to heaven, but God has more for you. And he's saying it's time for you to cross over. Amen? Amen. Now, the difference between being born again and having the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a difference in, the, in operating in the supernatural. Look at the second paragraph under F. Those who are born again have the Spirit like water in a well, but those who are baptized in the Spirit have that Spirit like the waters of a river. The difference is not of kind, but of volume and power. The baptism of the Spirit gives to a believer greater manifestation of the presence of God and induce him or her with the supernatural power of God. That's what Acts 1.8 is. But you shall receive dunamis or power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Acts 1.8. Being baptized in the Spirit is not a requirement for salvation or going to heaven. On the contrary, it is offered to those who believe. That is to those who are already born again. It is, however, a requirement for operating in God's supernatural power. If you want to be empowered for daily living, empowered in your prayer life, empowered in your witnessing, you want to operate in the supernatural, the gifts of the Spirit, then you need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So now, let's talk a little bit about receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let's turn over to page four there, point number three, Roman number, numeral three, receiving the infill. Are you guys getting anything out of this? Or you guys already know this and you've gone, you know, this is all, yeah, okay. Re number three, receiving the infilling or baptism in the Holy Spirit is not a complicated process. It is as simple as getting born again and receiving the eternal life of God. The gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost and is available today to who, whoever will ask for it and receive by faith. Jesus said, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Well, what's the requirement here? Well, there's one requirement, really two, but we'll just kind of follow the notes here. The requirement is that you must be born again. That's the number one requirement. Um, and l let's just read that second paragraph under point A, uh, where it says this is only prerequisite for receiving this blessing, meaning being born again. Some Christians mistakenly believe that we must prove to God that we are holy or worthy enough to receive. God is thought to somehow look to see whether or not we deserve this blessing before he will bestow it. But the Bible calls the infilling of the Spirit a gift. You don't earn a gift, my friends. You receive a gift. It's bestowed by the Father, Acts 1, 4, 2, and 38. As with all gifts which God gives, this one is given on the basis of grace and love. God's grace and love, not on the basis of our goodness or worthiness. Look at that bold part. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is not reserved for those Christians who are holy or mature enough to receive. Look at this. Cornelius didn't have to wait until the, he was mature in the Lord before he received it. He got born again and he got, he got filled. We'll look at that in a little while. The Samaritans didn't have to wait for years to receive. <laughs> they didn't wait for years. They, they, uh, there was an urgency about them receiving, which brought the apostles down from Jerusalem. Acts 8, 14 through 16. This blessing from God has been made available to every Christian on the basis of the fact that they are born again. Even the apostle Paul. The apostle Paul, he received almost immediately after he got saved. So it's not something that you have to wait till you attain to some super spiritual level before God wants to give it to you. Because if you had to wait for that, that means you're earning it and you're trying to do it by works. And it's not by works. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God operates by grace. It's through faith. You receive it the same way you receive salvation. The same way. Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And that's how it operates. And then you start to pray in it. You just, and you just, you receive it. It's a free gift. The baptism is as much a free gift as a salvation as with any gift which God says this one must be received by faith. By faith. It's, it's, it's by faith. It's not by works. 
It's not by trying to earn it. It's not by trying to work hard for it. It's not trying to, you know, and, and I like what, what this says here, that some mistakenly believe that one must tarry for the infilling of the Holy Spirit before they can receive. I believe in tarrying, and I believe in waiting on God, and I believe in, I do believe in that. But the kind of tarrying for the Holy Spirit here that we see in the book of Acts is different than the kind of tarrying that we do today. We don't have to necessarily tarry and wait for the God to just come in and just and, and fill us with the Holy Spirit. Like a lot of times we're just waiting for God to do it. But the truth is, is he's already sent his Holy Spirit. He sent him on the day of Pentecost. He sent the Holy Spirit right there. You have to realize the Holy Spirit had, had not come. He had not come. He, look, look at this in... Uh, in, in number one, tarrying in Jerusalem. Jesus told those disciples to tarry in Jerusalem to receive the Holy Spirit when he was sent. Up to that time, the Holy Spirit had not yet been given in fullness because Jesus had not yet ascended and sat at God's right hand. After the day of Pentecost, tarrying was no longer necessary as subsequent accounts of the infilling of the Spirit bear out in the book of Acts. Well, we just looked at, you can see it in Cornelius, you can see it in Paul, you can see it in the Samaritans. In fact, you even see it in, the, in uh, Acts 19, where Paul goes to Ephesus. They weren't even, they weren't tarrying for it. When Paul got there, the Holy Spirit, boom, they received it. The only time you find tarrying is in Acts chapter 2, in the day of Pentecost. In all the other cases, they're not tarrying for it. But somehow we've, we've adopted that as a theology. We said, well, they tarried in Acts 2, so we need to tarry too, we need to wait. But it's not necessary. We receive by faith. Now, you could call it tarrying in that sense, where I'm, I'm, you know, there might be a, a delay between the time that I believe I receive and the time that I actually am filled. But you believe you receive in that moment. But we're not just waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. He's here now. He's, he's here right now, this very moment. But they had to tarry because Jesus was with them. And as long as Jesus was with them, the Holy Spirit hadn't yet come. Let me turn to John 14, verse 26, and just kind of read a few scriptures. John 14, 26. Jesus said this, that the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. So the Comforter, the Father says he will send him. When Jesus was before they tarried in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit had not yet come. Jesus said, the Father is going to send him. The Comforter will come. He will send him. Look at chapter 15, verse 26 in John. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify to me. Now, let me just ask you this question. Jesus said, well, he says the Father will send it in chapter 14, and Jesus said he's going to send it in chapter 15, so we know that both the Father and the Son are sending the Holy Spirit. If the Holy... If, if the Father and the Son have already sent the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, is he still sending him? No, because he's already here. So if he says that the comforter whom I will send in Acts chapter 15 says, I'm going to send him. The question is, is he still sending him? No, because he already sent him. He sent him already in Acts chapter 2. He sent them on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they heard a, a sound of a rushing mighty wind. What am I trying to say? He's already here. Jesus isn't sending him and then resending him and resending him. He's here. So what do we do with it? Well, we have to receive it. And that's what they were doing in Acts. That's what they were doing in, at Cornelius' house. They were receiving him. Paul, receiving it. And they were often doing it through the laying on of hands. They were just, you know, lay hands and it was like just like a transfer. So I just want to kind of dethrone that 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 sacred cow, if you will, because it's in a lot of our denominations and it's actually it's it's cause it causes a lot of people to not receive because they're still waiting. They think that they have to wait for God to send him. If you will ask the Father for the Holy Spirit, he will give it to you. He will give him to you. Look at let the last paragraph there. Tarrying is no longer necessary. 
that this was a specific commandment only for the disciples is seen in the fact that Cornelius and his household did not in any way tarry for the Spirit. They received while they were listening to the message. The disciples in Ephesus received when Paul laid his hands on them, and there was no tarrying recorded there. The same is true of the Samaritan believers. They received when the apostles laid their hands on them. The only time, my friends, that you, you see any kind of tarrying is in Acts chapter 2. You cannot find it anywhere else. Because, and why were they tarrying? Because he hadn't come yet. They, did, they had to wait. That's why Jesus said, go wait. Go wait in Jerusalem. You don't, you'll never hear God say, go, well, you never know. But you'll never hear him say, go wait in, at Community Gospel Church in Birchwood Road until you are endued with power from on high. What he might tell you is go to Community Gospel Church on Birchwood Road so that you can be endued with power from on high. And we have him. We have the Holy Spirit. He's, he's here. We just need to receive him. We need to receive the infilling, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is, when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what's the evidence that I have the Holy Spirit? What is the evidence that I have the infilling? Well, just turn over to the next, next page, number five, and you'll just read that first paragraph under the Bible evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit, there is a supernatural manifestation or evidence of that inward feeling. Filling. That manifestation is called speaking with other tongues or languages. Speaking with other tongues is simply speaking in a language which one has never learned and does not understand with his mind. Throughout the book of Acts, we find evidence that this sign accompanied the infilling of the, whole, of the Spirit. So tongues, speaking in other tongues, is evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul says that there are various kinds of tongues. There are tongues where you have, which means different languages. There are earthly languages, earthly tongues. There have been, and we see that in Acts chapter 2, when the disciples were filled and they began to speak in other tongues, the Bible says that those who were present heard them speaking in their own native languages. So right there, they were speaking in native languages. But that's not the only kinds of tongues. There are, there are heavenly tongues, meaning that it's all part of the same gift of speaking in other tongues. They're the personal prayer language, like the Apostle Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. And he's talking about his own personal language that he prays to God that no, that his mind can't understand, but, it, and his, but his spirit prays. And, but, the, but God understands it, the Holy Spirit understands it because he's praying, he's giving him utterance. But there's different types of tongues. So don't think that the only kind of tongues that there are are the ones in Acts chapter 2 which is native languages. That does happen. You can be, in, I've, I've, I've known missionaries who have been on the missions field and there were people that came into the meeting and they started to speak in other tongues. They were sort of preaching in tongues. And it turns out that the people that they were ministering to were they, were, they were speaking in their own native language and they didn't even know that language. It would be like me speaking in another foreign language right now and, 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 I, and I have no idea you know, to Tagalog or, you know, something like that. If I started speaking in that right now, you'd be like, whoa, or speaking in, in, in Chinese or something. Well, I don't know Chinese, but I, but it, but if I was on the mission field and I, and I had to do it, I, I you know, if, if I felt inspired by the Holy Spirit to start speaking in it, I believe that the Holy Spirit would, you know, give me those words and to those people it would be intelligible to them. And God can do that. But in your own private time, in your own private prayer language, typically you're not going to be speaking in another native language unless you're using it for an evangelistic purpose. So that's why Paul says there are various kinds of tongues, various kinds of, 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 of speaking in tongues. And I don't have time to go through all of that. But I just want you to see what happens when you get filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the evidence? So we're all taught, well, the evidence is this or the evidence is that. And, but, but what is the Bible evidence say? The day of Pentecost, it says there, just look at that bold part. It says um, at the bottom of that paragraph, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So they were filled. Well, what when they got filled, what happened? They began to speak with tongues. Look at point number two of Cornelius' house. Let's just read where it should be underlined. The Holy Spirit fell on them as they were listening to Peter preach, and they were filled with the Spirit. Peter and his companions knew that these Gentiles had received the Spirit because they heard them speak in other tongues. And all the circumcised believers with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. 
Well, how do we know? For they were hearing them speaking with other, or speaking with tongues and exalting God. So how do we know that the gift of the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius' house? Well, the Bible says here that they heard them speaking with tongues. Look at the Ephesian disciples. In his missionary travels, Paul came across some disciples in Ephesus who had been taught incorrectly. They were not aware of the existence of the Holy Spirit. After Paul had straightened out their beliefs, he laid his hands on them for them to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they what? Began speaking with tongues and prophesying. Prophesying could also be another evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. But typically, what we find, if you look at point number four, out of all of the cases in the book of Acts, out of the five recorded incidences of people receiving the infilling of the Holy Spirit, there's only three out of those five that it evidences speaking in other tongues. So speaking in tongues is always is mentioned three out of the five times. Well, what about the other two? Why is it mentioned there? Well, it's inferred or implied. Look at uh, this, what happened here in the Samaritans, point A. The Samaritans received the infilling of the Holy Spirit by the laying of the apostles' hands. Then they, the apostles, began laying their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Um, look at, yep, uh, Acts 8, 18. The outward effect that the, the receiving the Spirit had upon those believers was profound enough to catch Simon's attention. This outward manifestation had to be more than just joy or exuberance, for these were already present before the apostles arrived. What Simon saw was so supernatural that it made him covet the authority to lay hands on others as the apostles had done. Let me just kind of briefly summarize this for a moment. When they had laid hands on the Samaritans, the Bible says, it doesn't say that they actually you know, spoke in tongues there. It just says that, that Simon the sorcerer saw that when they laid hands on them, that the Holy Spirit was given. And But we don't, so we said, well, what, what did he see that made him want to co covet this you know, this ability to, to transfer the Holy Spirit. Well, probably he saw them speaking in other tongues. Probably that's, that's what's implied there. Because he saw something. But we don't, the text never says what he saw. It just says that he, when he saw that the Holy Spirit was given. Well, what, what do you see? You know, did they start shaking or whatever? Well, it doesn't say. But I do know this. Day of Pentecost, Cornelius' household, the Ephesians' disciples, well, right there it says that they all spoke in tongues. So it's probable that what Simon saw was them, this outward, visible, observable manifestation was speaking in other tongues, more than likely. And, you, and now, and the same is true with the Apostle Paul. If you go to the next page, point number B, Paul was converted on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to him, Acts 9, 5, and 6. But he did not receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit until Ananias came and laid his hands on him. Although the scripture does not state here that Paul began to speak in tongues, I love this, Paul later told the Corinthian church that he did speak in tongues more than them all. 1 Corinthians 14, 18. So when the Apostle Paul, it says that Ananias laid his hands on them, on him, and he received his sight, and he received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't say that Paul spoke in tongues. But we do know that in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. So he must have spoken in tongues at some point. I believe he spoke in tongues the moment he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because that's typically, three out of the five times, that's what, that's what would be manifested, or was manifested. So... And it makes sense in a way because when you receive the baptism, the, f the very first thing out of those three instances that happen is that they begin to immediately pray in another language. It's like kind of like being filled up. It's like that well of water you've got, you know, you're born in, but now it's like a river out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So if a river was coming up out of you, the So it's just like, you know, there's a river and it's it just starts flowing out of you. You know, it's just like, oh, and you just let it flow. Just let that river. So, I, I believe that in at least three out of the five, the evidence for being filled with the Holy Spirit was speaking in other tongues. The other two at least could be argued that it was speaking in other tongues. And at least with the Apostle Paul, we know he spoke in tongues. Because 1 Corinthians 14, 18. So, now... Uh, We've looked at this as being a river already. Look down at the three quarters of the page there. There are several benefits to praying in tongues, which we can 
we, uh, we can see from the scriptures. One is edification. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 4, the, the Bible says that one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. And that word edify means to build up. So when you, well, let's just read that. When a person prays in tongues, he or she is building themselves up on the inside. That is their spirit. The inner man is being strengthened. Jude 20 says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit is the same thing as praying in tongues. Those who pray in tongues build themselves up because their spirits are praying directly to God. My friends, I pray in tongues every single day. Every day that I wake up and I get into my car, I pray in the Spirit. I pray in the Holy Spirit because it's a heavenly language that God gives us. And when I pray in the Spirit, it builds me up. It makes me more sensitive to the Spirit of God. It strengthens my inward man. It helps me to, to, uh, to withstand against temptation. And, it, it just, and, it, and the Holy Spirit uses that to fill me. And it's, it's called edification. And you get built up that way. It, and that's why the devil, he fights this so much. And he wants to rob the body of Christ of this. And so I encourage you, if you speak in tongues, don't stop. Don't let him rob you of this. If you wake up in the morning, when you get in your car or whatever you're doing, pray in tongues. If you're taking a shower, pray in tongues. Do it as much as you can wherever you can. I used to have a job and everybody would go outside and smoke and I'd, I'd go out the back door and just pray in tongues. Hope nobody saw me and th thought I was a nut. <laughs> and it helps, he helps us in our intercession. Romans 8, 26, I, I know we, we've taught on this. Praying in tongues, when we pray in tongues, we allow the Holy Spirit to pray through us. Prayers which are in accordance with the perfect will of God. The will of God. Likewise, the Spirit helps us uh, in our infirmities, or that word should be weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, this is like intercessory prayer. This is, this is special when, when you, sometimes the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will feel like a burden for somebody. If you feel that burden for somebody, it's good. You pray in the natural, but sometimes your natural reasoning can only go so far. So you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. You yield yourself to the Spirit of God. And there's, sometimes it, it's accompanied with groanings. Like there's like a groan. It's, that's that burden of the, of the Spirit on you. And you start praying. And I could, I could give you testimony after testimony of, of, of times where, where God has used me in, in, that, in that capacity. Um, I remember just being in a, in a camp meeting about 20 years ago. And I just remember just feeling this burden to pray for somebody. And I was like, what is this? And there were some... There were some ladies there that were just full of the Holy Spirit, and they said, you know, what you're feeling is from the Holy Spirit. You need to pray in the Spirit right now. You need to pray in tongues. So they joined with me as we prayed in the Holy Spirit, and they said that when there's a victory, when there's a breakthrough, you're going to feel a release of joy. It's going to come. So I said, well, let's do it. So we started to pray, and I mean, I must have been about 20 years old. We were praying and praying and praying and praying for, probably for about a half an hour, and I'm praying in the Spirit, and I suddenly just felt like a release, like a joy. And we just knew we had the breakthrough. We knew we had a victory. Over what? I had no idea. But I found out later in that meeting that they said that there was somebody that was having a heart attack in, in, right during that time while that meeting was going on. Not a heart attack. He was having heart chest pains. And he was, he was laid up in one of, the, one of the, uh, the, not the pews. This was like a big conference center, but one of the chairs. And he remembered, and, and, but during that time, the Lord sustained him and kept him and, and touched his body. And we believe that that victory was, it was actually for that person. It was intercession. Because we didn't know what to pray for. But the Holy Spirit knew. And we, as we began to pray in the Spirit, He began to give us utterance. And He began to pray the perfect will of God out. According, according to the will of God. Why? Because He who knows the mind of the Spirit knows how to make intercession according to the will of God. And look at the next verse. You don't have to look at it there, but I know it in my head. And we know that all things work together for our good. Right after that, he says, we know that all things work together for our good. In verse Romans 8, 28. So God caused, that, caused what we were doing to work together for our good. And I mean, I, I've shared it with my daughter who was sick. And the Holy Spirit was burdening me every day to pray for her. And I began to just go down in the basement and just pray in the Spirit and pray and pray in tongues and pray in tongues. I was praying in tongues so much I got tired of it. I have to tell you the truth. My, my mouth was starting to hurt during that time. 
And I was wondering, when is there going to be a breakthrough? Because they were saying she had multi-cystic kidney disease, that maybe one of her kidneys was going to be completely destroyed and wiped out. And I just, and I just, and, and the holy, and I had asked God to heal her, but when I asked God to heal her, shortly after that, this burden came on me to just pray in the Holy Spirit. And I began to pray, and I, and I remembered my time at camp meeting when we were praying for that man with the heart condition. And how there was, when there was a release, I knew that victory had come. When there was some kind of sense of joy. But when I was praying for my daughter for months, I wasn't feeling any joy. And I'd wake up and I'd feel this burden to pray. I was like, oh, why do I feel this? When is this thing gonna break? And months went by and, and we were just, I was praying in the spirit and one night I just felt this lift, like, like a release. It was like, it was like, you know, like somebody let the, the, the Coke bottle cap off and, just, and I just felt this joy. And I was like, oh, Lord, I know we've got the victory. And my wife went to the doctors and they said, they looked at the, her kidney and I said, I only see a couple little dots. And we went like three weeks later, there's only two dots. I'm not exaggerating. A few weeks later, running again, I only see one dot on her kidney. A couple weeks later, what? She has what? I remember it being in an office saying, we don't see anything. Are you sure she had something there? Yeah, well, you were the guys who told us. You had, like, all these, her kidneys were ravaged. Glory to God. So the power that is available to you and I is tremendous. Thank God. Thank God. So I'm so grateful for that. You know, and it's, you know, and I'm not saying it's a perfect world. I'm not saying there are things that we don't challenges. We, you know, we, we go through lots of challenges, lots of things. And the Holy Spirit leads in different ways. He doesn't always lead this way. He may lead you in a different path or a different way for different circumstances. And I believe that if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're missing out. And God will work with you in whatever capacity he can, but it's so much better over here on this side. You know, but don't feel sorry for yourself. Don't feel like there's something wrong with you if you've not yet received it. I believe that there's a reason why I'm teaching on this. Because there are some here that are not. There are some here that, are, that have been waiting for a long time. And God says it's time to stop waiting and it's, it's time to start receiving. Start receiving. Receive it by faith. Just receive it by faith. I was just watching uh, Marilyn, Marilyn Hickey. And she was doing this whole series on... Uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I just flicked it on, just saw her talking about it. And, and she got to the point where she said, okay, everybody, now, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? And she went through that, that verse in Luke chapter, I believe it's uh, chapter 11, where it says that uh, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your father, uh, give good gifts to your children, I mean, uh, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So she said that, and then she said, well, here's how you do it. She says, you, you ask the Father, Father, please, I, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you ask him, Lord, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And thank you right now. I just believe I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I receive you, Holy Spirit. And then she said, just start, and just open your mouth and start speaking in tongues. And then she just, and then she just, and you just start speaking it. Just let it, just, just let, you know, point in case is that God needs your faith and your action. Stop waiting for him to try to drop it on you. And just, just go with it. Just, just step out in faith and just release. Release yourself. And let him just speak through you. Well, what if nothing happens? Well, nothing happens. No big deal. You're not going to get hurt. Just let God, you know, you know, when I when I got, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. You can read through the rest of this. There's, there's you know, praying for the unknown, it's a means of worship, there's the public and uh, private use of it, um, and then there's this whole thing on that. There's just a couple little points. I can read through that when you have time. But when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I this was back in the very early nineties. And I'll I'll never forget it. You know, my friends were you know they, all of them, I would say, were in a charismatic church, and they were all speaking in tongues at this time, except for myself, and I remember feeling left out. I remember feeling like, man, you know, I, I was like, Lord, I want this. I was like, I was hungry. I wanted this. I said, God, I want the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I said, I, I want this. And, and, I, you know, and there's a sense where, yeah, you are waiting on him, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm waiting, but I'm, I'm like, I don't know when, how, I don't know how to really 
do this or how it's going to happen. But, but I got baptized in water. And uh, I was coming home that night. And I was driving in my car. And I had some music on. And I was just so happy in the Lord. I was just thrilled that I had gotten baptized in water. And I'm driving home, and I'm just, you know, praising. I'm like, I started just, just shouting, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, glory to God, and go And I just started speaking in tongues like that, and just a little bit. And then I was like, whoa. I'm like, is that it? And, and, I, and, I, and then I did it again. I'm like, I'm like, whoa. You know you have it when it just it flows out of you. And you can, you can just, it's like, it's like somebody gives you a language. Uh, it's like they, they, like you, you've got this language and you can talk in it. Like I, if I could speak Spanish, I could just talk in it. Some of you that speak a second language, you, it's like you just kind of switch off and you just go into the second language. It's the same concept. But you're not praying it out of your head, you're praying it out of your heart, out of your spirit. So you are the one who's praying in the tongues. The Holy Spirit thing, he gives you the utterance. He gives you that special, you know, he makes it, he, he anoints it. You know, it's, 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 it's supposed to break through you. It takes hold, the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, he takes hold together with you in that moment and he begins to break through you. But he doesn't just take control of you. And there, and let me just say this, there are some hindrances to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There are, there are things, and I'm not going to spend long on this, but there are hindrances, and I'm closing here. Some people, they don't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they hold on to bitterness and they're resentful. You gotta let that stuff go. You cannot receive from God if you're if you're holding on to stuff against people. You gotta let it go so you can receive. Unbelief. People say, I don't believe that stuff. Well, you'll never be bothered with it. Don't worry about it. It'll never bother you. God will never bother you with it. If you don't believe in it, it it'll never bother you. Well, and then there's wrong believing. People say, well, God no longer moves that way anymore. Well, again. If you don't believe, you don't receive. Well, I'm scared, but look, if you, being natural, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask Him? He says, what son of yours, if he came to you, if he asked you for fish, would you give him a scorpion? Jesus, no. If he came to you and asked you for bread, would you give him a rock? No. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So if you ask the whole, for the Holy Spirit, you're not going to get a demon, you're not going to get a devil, you're going to get the Holy Spirit. First of all, the devil doesn't even want you to have the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's trying to keep that from you. So, But there's nothing to be afraid of because it's, it's only good. And then there are people who are satisfied. They're satisfied where they're at. Lord, I'm, I'm okay with what I have, what I've received. I, I don't, you know. That's as far as you're going to go. And it's sad because God has so much more. And it will add another dimension to your life. I used to, I used to joke around about how that when I grew up, I grew up on motorcycles. And we used to have, uh, we had four strokes and two strokes. We had racing bikes and we had bikes that were like cruisers. Just, you know, bikes that were just, uh, you know, you, you could just... Just, yeah, they weren't really racing bikes. They would go pretty fast, but they just, they were, they, they, they were cruisers. But then you had the racing bikes. And the racing bikes, they had what was called a power band. And that was like an extra gear that was on top of, the, uh, on top of your gears. And so when you would hit the throttle, it would, it would go, and it would just like, it would kick in, and it would give you this extra boost. It was kind of like having nitro attached to your tank. And if you weren't careful, the bike would fly out from underneath your hand, out of your hands, because it was, it was very powerful. And that's kind of like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can just kind of cruise and but when you get the baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's like getting that extra gear on top of those gears. As a you know, and it's, it'll, it'll take you to another level, another dimension. I'm not saying that you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna turn into Superman, you're not gonna, you're not gonna grow any hair, I can attest to that. You're not going to look any younger. You know, it's not going to, you know, you're not going to, it's, that's not going to happen. But it's going to add another dimension to your life. And I've heard of people who've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, they'll sometimes say, like, after they've been saved for years, waited years, 20, 30 years, and then they got filled with the Holy Spirit and they come back and say, you know, I feel like I've been born again again. So it's, it's, it's interesting. 
So, uh, and then there's just wrong thinking. People say, I tried that, it didn't work, it must not be for everyone. Ah, must not be for everyone. You know, after all, didn't the Apostle Paul say that do all speak with tongues? Didn't he say, do I? And he said, no, they don't all speak with tongues. Well, what's he talking about there? He's talking about the public use of speaking in tongues. When he was writing to the Corinthian church, he was talking about order in the church. And he was talking about the gift. See, he was talking about one of the nine gifts of the Spirit, which is tongues and interpretation of tongues. Where somebody gives a tongue in church and somebody interprets that. That's what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about what, we're, what I'm talking about, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Remember, there are various kinds of tongues. So what he was really saying was, do all speak in the gift of the Spirit of speaking in other tongues? And the answer is no. Not everybody's going to operate in that. That's a public. That's for public use. Um, so, if God wants me to have it, He'll give it to me. No, you have to receive it by faith. So that's all I'm going to give you on, on that. So, so I want to pray for you. And you know, if if uh, you know you want prayer in this area of your life, I'm here. You know, and the Holy Spirit is here, and it doesn't have to happen through a preacher. It can happen in your own prayer, private time with the Lord. You know, so, but I want to encourage you, you know, to, to, to seek God for it. You know, let, let him let him have his way and let him let him fill your heart and uh, you know just just let him you know let, let, let him do it. Let him do it. Let him do it in your heart. Why don't we why don't we uh, why don't we stand to our feet? You guys get anything out of that? Yeah? So I'm going to dismiss you, and if anybody does want any prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to stay around for a little while. So just, uh, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, tonight. We thank you for bringing us out. Lord, I pray that what we have heard tonight, Lord, would sink down into our hearts and that you would make this real to us, Lord, and cause us, Lord, to be filled with you and Lord, I just ask that you would just baptize everyone in here, Lord. Lord, even on our YouTube channel, Lord, baptize those who may will be listening even right now, Lord. Baptize them in your Holy Spirit. Even as John said, that when he comes, meaning Jesus, that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Lord, baptize your people in your precious Holy Spirit and with fire, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You are dismissed. God bless you, and we'll pick it up on Sunday.